Hi, and welcome to the episode of In Conversation with Interview Series regarding new topics, hot topics related to the corporate and the business world. Many businesses operate in conventional industries, industries where it is difficult to get organic growth. Similarly, many companies want to develop new products and services, but they feel it may take years to develop them in-house. And then the third category of companies are those which feel that they don't necessarily have the right culture to create something in-house. They don't have the right agility in-house to create these new services and products. Many of these problems can be solved by a new and a novel concept called co-creation. Today's topic is about co-creation and we are joined by one of the industry experts, Nico Eggert. Nico, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So Nico, let's start with a bit of an introduction of what you've done in the past and uh, uh, something related to co-creation. Yeah, sure. So I spent my career in um, banking and in insurance, usually building uh, new capabilities, whether it's business intelligence or developing new operating models that are that are uh, highly driven by digital technologies. And a lot of times you, uh, you operate in areas that are not part of your core business. And as you venture away from that, uh, you become more and more dependent on uh, on help from outside partners, uh, from from people that do some of the things that you need to do a lot better than you ever could. So, um, especially over the last five years or so, I've always had to build partnerships with uh, with external companies, whether they're established players or uh, or startups. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, since one of the uh, items that we try and um, introduce or try and discuss in this sort of interviews series is gaining a deep understanding of the concept of co-creation. You know, um, any specific examples uh, of that you may have seen or experienced yourself or heard about in the industry that has really helped companies to grow? Hmm. So I'm currently based in Korea where I'm trying to tackle the challenge of engaging consumers online. Um, my industry at the moment is life insurance uh, where notoriously we don't have a lot of touch points with our customers. So we did spend a lot of time over the last couple of years thinking about where we can create value for Korean consumers, uh, not necessarily directly linked to insurance, but not too far away. And we've landed on health. So we've, uh, we've tried to understand how we can engage with consumers around health. And a lot of those interactions happen through our agents as well. Um, it's something that is on people's minds and it, we do have some adjacent products that are closely related to health insurance, but it's something that's very, um, um, that's challenging for, for our agents in particular because they're not experts in that topic, but it's something that customers care about. So we started out seeing our, um, our agents as our customers uh, and, and just try to figure out how can we help them have these types of conversations, introduce products, but really talk about things uh, like managing your health or even assessing where you are. And um, we, we try to understand what role can we play in there and what role do the partners play. Um, we made it about health assessments. Mm -hmm. There are several things that we're good at. We have a, obviously we have a lot of customers. We have a great agency for us. Um, and we're good at quantitating, uh, quantifying risk. Right? But we're not really good at the health aspect of things. So we look for partners that can, can fill those gaps. Um, one of our key partners uh, is a local startup here that has technology that lets you measure blood pressure through a smartphone camera lens. So we partnered very closely with them to build a product that's bespoke to us uh, and that our agents can use in the field. And now we're rolling that into something that is more of a consumer facing solution that our customers can download and, and use on their phone. Excellent, excellent. Um, you know, uh, when you hear uh, some of these success stories, um, often what you find is uh, uh, that uh, they're really good, you know, and, and really make sense. Uh, and then, you know, why didn't we think of it earlier kind of thing, right? Uh, but when you really start out in this journey, it often is fraught with challenges, etc. So, So if you were to advise uh, somebody else um, who may be looking at at an option of growing, how would you sort of describe it to them? What would you say, where do they need to start? Because I'm, I'm sure it's not some, you know, one day you had a dream that I need to co-create and you came up with the idea, but you know, so, so what would you advise them, you know, where to start? 
Right. Now, it, it certainly didn't start with an epiphany overnight. Um, <laughs> it, starts, uh, it starts with a customer. It sounds cliche, but um, if you don't know who you're serving, um, you're going to end up building something that that is not of value to anyone, really. And you see this time and again, and it's frankly something that um, that large companies are really good at at doing, you know, building things that take a lot of money and a lot of time and in the end are not being used because they're just not solving any problem. So really anchoring yourself around who's the customer that I'm looking at and then making sure you understand the problems that they have and, and identify at least one that you're trying to solve, uh, that you're in a good position to solve. And uh, as I mentioned initially, we looked at our agents as customers first, but we wanted to use that as a stepping stone to then mm -hmm. solve consumer problems as well. Well, we try to get uh, go one step at a time. Um, and I think if as long as you you start there and you keep the focus on that, am I still serving my, my customer? If I'm building this new feature, if I take the solution this direction, am I still serving the people that I'm that I'm looking to serve? I think if you um, if you keep your mind on that, um, it's it's fairly hard to go completely wrong. Sure, sure, and and I think. Um... Um, in, in your solution, as I understood, um, digital plays a big part, you know, so, so what, what should people be looking at, you know, why should they choose digital versus um, connecting with their customers through other channels, you know, what's, what's the digital part about here? Yeah. Right. Um, so it's not so much about the technology, or I don't think it should be, uh, which is a bit ironic, is all my job titles have digital in them. But um, I think it's more digital capabilities or technology, it's just a medium, right? Ultimately, what should drive the decision is where you put something should be where your customer wants you to meet them. Sure. If, uh, if we had thought we can, we can solve this problem by putting out brochures or, or um, educational videos, we would have done that. Right. Uh, but we, we figured that this was the best way uh, to go, just simply that's where, where our customers, Koreans are very, uh, Technically, uh, technically savvy. So uh, everybody uses their phone for everything. Yeah. Um, so that was there was really no debate over what what medium we should be using. Um, but there are some things that are particularly true um, to digital touch points that uh, that just simply add value, and it's it's basically scale and data. Right. Um, so scale. Uh, you know, if you if you bring brochures or you uh, you know you you um, do something physical, create a physical product. It's, it's a lot more difficult and a lot more costly to scale, right? So the uh, ideally the marginal cost for an additional user is zero or it's mm -hmm. low enough to not really make a significant dif uh, difference. So that's, uh, that's always a consideration. Um, and the second part is the data. So we, we have a lot of projects in the company as, as do most large corporates that are creating touch points and that are solving uh, particular challenges, uh, whether they're customer facing or internal facing, um, but they serve a purpose. So does this app, right? It is an engagement mechanism that um, solves the problem of where's my health status today for a customer or uh, in the agent scenario helps having that conversation through a very quick, very intuitive health assessment. Um, but the secondary part of that is we collect data with that and not in a nefarious way, uh, you know, trying to do micro-targeting for political ads or anything like that, um, but in a, in a much simpler uh, way. If, again, if you think about life insurance, um, our touch points with, the, um, with our customers are very, very limited. So if you take the average customer, they might have one or two products. Uh, they bought one five years ago. At some point, uh, they had a claim because they had some sort of accident and went on disability. Um, and then two years later, they bought another another uh, product. So that's basically three transactions, three touch points over the course of five years, not counting birthday emails that nobody reads and all those sure. things. So that's the status quo for our industry. And there are many industries that are similar. Um, but with uh, with a digital touch point, with a health assessment app, any any login is its own transaction. We right. could go down even further and say every single click in the app that I can track, any article that you read on there is another touch point for me that tells me about um, the customer's behavior and then uh, by extension their needs and their wants, which help, helps me tailor uh, products to their needs. Um, and I think that's that's just a big driver there. I think there's no um, there there's no bigger lever that we could possibly have. Sure, and I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that you mentioned here, 
uh, is is on data and, and we'll, we'll come to that uh, part uh, you know in just a, a few seconds uh, but before we do that um, you know when it comes to when it comes to co-creation you know what you just described the data the power of data the understanding you know um, on its hindsight everything is 2020 right but mm. uh, you know when people would start off you know this is literally the idea of co-creation is literally quite far-fetched for many organizations right um, and 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 when let's say a company would start off on the journey on the mission you know that yeah co-creation is something that uh, they would like to pursue you know a couple of things i think i think they they would like to hear from you why should they choose co-creation and then how should they go about socializing the idea with their leadership and stakeholders um, I think it very quickly comes to, uh, can you realistically do all the things that you need to do? Right? What are the capabilities that you have in house? And are you confident you could, that you can build um, that capability yourself? Can you develop that in, in due time or not? I think that's the most natural way that co-creation comes about. And once you've embraced that, um, you've, you might be a specialist company, and this is not this is not a particular to, to our industry. But um, you might be very good at one or two things, and you um, may or may not be humble as to the things that you don't do well. The, the earlier you recognize the things that you're not good at, the easier it becomes, um, whether it's at the team level or at the at the leadership level, to convince people that we need to go outside and partner. Um, but I think there's a there's a point to be, or a case to be made about uh, bringing in different viewpoints. There are many times it um, a, an external partner can bring in an angle from a different industry um, or a different background, or just simply because the demographic makeup of that company is uh, different, if and if only in age, um, where you you start unlocking opportunities you didn't even know were there. Or you might start out on one point and then you might zigzag to something slightly different, but even more powerful. Um, so I think it's just really, uh, again, like with the, the digital question or uh, why choose uh, digital capabilities or technology to, to solve problems. Um, I think in the future, there's no way past that, right? Mm -hmm. Marketplace has become increasingly complex, and at the same time, consumer expectations uh, rise by the by the month almost. Um, you know, we have to realize that you're not just competing uh, when it comes to consumer. You're not just competing to people in your industry. You're competing with everybody else. Uh, we are not competing with the online insurance of another life insurer. Once somebody signed up with us, they're unlikely to buy policies from another life insurer. Right? That's that's our customer. We have a relationship with them. What they're comparing their um, their experience to is uh, how easy was it uh, for them to buy something on Amazon or to buy the airline ticket and change their seat compared to you know, the, the paperwork, the actual paperwork they might have to go through for uh, changing the coverage amount or the address on their, on their life insurance policy. And that's true for a lot of other industries as well. It's, it's, you have to look at a much larger competition and in order to become world-class, uh, you have no choice but to partner. Yeah, and I think I think you've raised a very very good point, you know, which is why uh, you know these days uh, when I when I do trainings and and take uh, 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 courses, I conduct courses. Uh, one of the things I, I often add uh, to Porter's five forces is exactly the point that you highlighted. It is it is no longer about, uh, as you rightly pointed out, you know, whether I'm I'm a, a, a consumer for a bank or an insurance company or I'm a consumer of, let's say, energy, utilities, et, et cetera. Uh, when it comes to customer service, I compare it with the likes of Amazon or, uh, you know, one of the um, uh, the other companies, you know. And that's when my comparison starts coming in. You know, it's no longer about, hey, I'm an energy company and I should compare myself, benchmark myself against another one. But literally, it's down to the customer experience. Um, so coming back to the uh, customer experience, you know, um, because literally, uh, what in, in co-creation? Because it's it's again a vast area that your consumers or your customers, uh, as well as prospects, have. Um, you know, what are some of the critical data elements that you uh, pick up, or you know, once you pick up from them, uh, regarding when you start looking at co-creation and digital. Um, uh, digital digitalization and the second thing is uh, what's usually the most effective way of capturing that data is that 
is that um, surveys or interviews or you know you know if you could share uh, some words of wisdom with the viewers on how they should go about doing this I'll start with the latter part first. Um, and it's always a mix, right? It's a mix of, of interviews or conversations and surveys, um, and in the end, hard data on, on behavior. And um, that mix changes over time. When you start out, you're very light on, on data, uh, and you might have to use a lot of proxies. Uh, but it's very easy to start having conversations. And it might just be your immediate vicinity. It might be um, colleagues, although that comes with its own pitfalls, uh, but just finding the people that you're looking for, your target audience, um, and and starting to engage with them. So it's the, the the clearer you are on who your persona is that you're building something for, uh, the easier it'll be for you to zoom in and find those people. So it's who is it, where are they, where can I find them to have a conversation with them? And it might be something as simple as going out and and interviewing people in the street. Right? I've, I remember a project that I did years ago where it was um, about relationships. Uh, between husband and wife in a particular country and and uh, can is there a solution that can aid communication uh, with a couple um, so I wanted to understand the the wife side of the story a little bit better so I literally took a bunch of interns we went to the kids library in in uh, the children's library in, in Singapore and uh, started interviewing mothers on on uh, what their you know what their thoughts are on the solution that we're thinking about. And we got very interesting feedback um, that nudged us in a certain direction. So it's really just uh, those initial conversations are some of the most most powerful and most insightful things that that will happen to you on this journey. So and then as you move along and you start building things and you might run some surveys or maybe focus groups, which I'm not a huge fan of. Because people kind of feed off each other and you just right. get a multiplying effect there. Um, and ultimately, you want to get to the point where you see the actual action. Because people will often tell you one thing and then act the exact opposite way. Would you buy this? No, I would never buy this. And then often those are the people that hit the buy button the hardest and the fastest. Right. Uh, and that's where you want to get. What's very important, though, is that you never lose that touch of a of an actual conversation right it's easy, really easy to just keep on digging in the data and become make everything quantifiable but um you need to continue to have those conversations and it's best if you create a channel through which to do that and then uh yes about data what what kind of data points and what kind of insights i think um in the beginning it's not so much about data it's about why mm -hmm. what is it what is the problem that you have um and are you solving it a certain way or are you mitigating that problem in a, in a way with some, some, some other behavior? Um, and, and why is that? And why are you not using this other thing that might be available to you? Because that helps you just understand whether your solution has any legs um, at all. And then um, later on, it's about finding, finding the right patterns, I guess. So, um, when you, when you start looking at, at data for insights, you know, there's all these things, cohort analysis and who sticks around the longest, who's the most engaged, um, I guess. And, and those are different, those metrics look very differently depending on what, what it is that you're building, right? Engagement metric might just be uh, how often do you go into that app or it might be how long do you stay when you're there or um, how much money do you spend on it? Um, then it, it really there isn't there isn't a one size fit all, but that's usually a progression. It's the the why and very uh, qualitative information, and then towards um, towards behavioral data that that's actually hard data and not uh, not make believe. Right, right. I, th I think that that's that's absolutely brilliant. Um, what you just shared. When people sort of start of this journey, um, and uh, um, what are some of the likely challenges that they're going to get from their stakeholders and from the leadership, especially at the initial stages? There's a wide range. It could be, it could be literally anything. Um, and especially if you're in a risk averse uh, culture uh, or company culture, then um, the the roadblocks are just going to come flying left and right. So uh, some of the things that I faced here in Korea were um, legal, um, legal questions uh, around since we're not a health company there's a very th fine line between health and wellness and sure. uh, medical malpractice right? right and it's very clear which side of the line that y you want to be on um, so that was that was one of the um, 
maybe not the most challenging ones, but one of the ones that we've obviously paid most attention to or spent the most time on, but there are other, other things about risk. Um, is this the right risk to take? What happens if uh, all these people uh, start buying our insurance, uh, but we just help them figure out that they're, they're sick, right? It's, um, sure. um, and it's, you know, every function that you work with internally views risk in a different way, right? Legal right. says, we don't want to get sued, right? That is the thing that we're taking care of. Um, other functions might uh, have more of a financial view than others look at, rep marketing looks at reputation, right? Are we going to get sued over, and not are we going to get sued over this, but are we going to get complaints over this? this is this going to tarnish right. our, our brand? You have all of these things. Um, what is most consistent, I think, across industry and across function is why should we be doing this? This mm -hmm. is far from our core business. Why? Why? Why should we bother? We do you really think we can ever be good at this? Um, you know, we're not we're not Fitbit or we're not Apple or you know, pick your uh, pick your tech company. Um, and for those, it's very hard to deflect that in the beginning, right? So what I what I prefer doing as much as possible is show up for the first conversation with something in hand. So I was called show don't tell. Right. If I go in and I draw a PowerPoint and say, hey, we should be launching this project and do this thing, um, people are going to start with all the reasons that it's not going to work. But if you come right. in and you spend very little money or ideally uh, no money at all, that, that's been some of my sweetest moments when I could walk in and say, hey, I've done all this stuff uh, by leveraging fa personal favors from other departments and doing some mm -hmm. free research and so on. Uh, and this is what I've built and this is what I've found. And I think there's an opportunity here. Now can I please have... You know, pick a number, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, because I found this opportunity. I think it's real. This is the size of the prize overall, I think, uh, depending on how much we can capture of that. And I have these two questions that will make or break this opportunity. And here's my plan for an experiment that I'm going to run for three months. All I need is two people and I need, again, $10,000 or whatever. Sure. And I'm going to do this to answer those questions. If you go into a conversation like that and mm -hmm. you make it about de-risking something, I'm, I'm actually running an experiment to answer this particular question mm -hmm. and you can kill this. I'll be the first one to say, kill this project if the question, if the answer is the wrong one or we find out that this doesn't have legs. Um, sure. And all of a sudden people listen. And all of a sudden the, uh, the, the, uh, the wallets become a little bit looser and, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a lot. It's a very fun way to work this way. Um, so I think that's um, that's really the the best way to to get through these roadblocks. The other one is data, right? And then everybody knows this, right? Bring data. Uh, one example of this is uh, I mentioned earlier the the risk component of this. What if we underwrite a lot of people that are more likely to get sick? Mm -hmm. So we went out and we we built a very very cheap app. Um, you know, single digit thousands, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and just threw it out at a handful of agents. We just let them go out and say, here's, here's this app. It's not branded. It's nothing. Just play around with this when you talk to a customer and they can do their health assessment. And, um, and this, is, this was uh, a, a, um, a pretty precise health assessment um, that used um, vital signs. Uh, so the results are reliable. And uh, we found out that a lot of the people that come in the door are already sick. I, the majority of the people are not in good health at all. If you, if you go with cardiovascular um, components. And so we could go back and say, hey, um, we didn't select for sick people here. These are the people that are walking in the door today. And, you know, increasingly with all these, with all, you know, with the wearables and all of that, our customers are going to know a lot more about their health than we do. And this is not about, you know, selecting or kicking out the ones that we don't want and all of this. It's really about being transparent on both sides, right? Information asymmetry is a, is a very big part there. So why don't we uh, charge this hat on and we are part of the conversation. We know what's going on and maybe we can help adjust behavior and lead to better outcomes. Because I'll Ultimately, that's what we want. Right? We want to underwrite as many people as possible. We're going to secure mm -hmm. as many people as possible, not not kick as many people out, right? Uh, and we want the best outcome. And once you're a customer, our interests are completely aligned. We want you to be healthy. We want you to have a long life and all of that. And uh, I think this is a very, very good way to have a different kind of conversation uh, with our customers. But it really, if I hadn't brought that data, uh, I think I would have never gotten as far as, as I did. Yeah, I think, I think that's that's very, very... Um, important points uh, for people who start getting started on this journey. Um, your journey was a lot of discovery moments, right? Panzer moments. You know, as you moved along, you learned more. Um, 
and uh, and and then you moved to uh, if 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 people who are listening in you know if if and when they get started on this journey how much of it would you think should be done as discovery versus how much of it should be done as scripted you know how would you go about mobilizing uh, the concept the idea in the organizations how much of it is discovery versus how much of it is going to be uh, scripted hmm. uh, well i would frame everything as discovery Okay. Like there, 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 are a number, there are a number of reasons for this, and some of it might be more obviously discovery, and other things that might not be. Um, I think discovery is exciting, right? Um, finding out new things and and uh, and reacting to it very quickly is something that energizes people, uh, and especially those that are not used to working this way. Right. So it does a number of things. It um, it helps you, as you say, mobilize other functions that you might rely on later in the, the process. My favorite example is always legal because a lot of people have um, a very, um, <laughs> have Black a lot of white. conflicts with legal, right? Okay. Yeah. So the, the thing is, you know, legal is there to have a, to, to, to do a particular job and it's not always right. just about keeping you, um, keeping you out of jail, but that's right. a big part of it. Um, it's, if you make the relationship with these functions that are more or less watchdogs or that you know are have, are going to have to give you a thumbs up or thumbs down at some point and you go in as somebody who's filing a request like you do with a government agency then that's the relationship that you choose to have with them and that's what you're going to get right so if you go in at the end of something and say okay can we now please have have approval for this grant plan um you put them in them in a position where they have to wrap their heads around a lot of things at the uh, at, at a at a very short notice uh and then make a judgment call on that and you're just waiting meanwhile and it's not that's not ideal now i've made that mistake uh, early in my career quite a bit until i got the hang of it and now what i try to do as much as possible is bring people to the table early on and it does two things a it helps them understand what you're trying to do and i'm trying right. to go from a to b and i'm pretty sure that i can't go in a straight line yeah. because of some regulation uh that i might be uh cognizant of or not uh so help me just react to this now, react to this thing, this idea that I'm kicking around. Here's what we're trying to do. This is how we're thinking about doing it. What's the first red flag uh, that pops up in your mind? And say, ah, oh, well, you know, if you do it this way, uh, there shouldn't really be any showstoppers, so you can do it this way. Or they say, well, you know, there's this rule about you cannot spend more than this amount of money on customers, so uh, why don't you break it up or, you know, whatever. They start becoming very creative. And as they become right. creative and they give input, they become engaged. So not only do you have a very energized partner who's proactively thinking with you around corners, you those people are very unlikely to shoot down your idea somewhere if there's some committee that has to decide on something, right? They become advocates for what you're doing. And that applies to legal, uh, legal and compliance or, you know, I had that same experience with with procurement, um, data and privacy, and all of those things, right? If you bring people on board, which isn't always easy in itself, but if you make sure. an effort and say, "Hey, I want your opinion on this. I want your creative input," then you start having very, very fruitful and very positive relationships with people, and that leads to great outcomes. Right, right. Um, you mentioned about an app that you developed, you know, sub, uh, um, you know, ten thousand um, dollars. Uh, hmm. You know, when you now look back at the whole solution, you know, uh, that you guys used, what sort of technologies did you use? Did you use AI? Did you use sort of predictive analytics, uh, big data, uh, you know, or was it just digital marketing? You know, what sort of uh, some of the digital elements that you used? Um, it's actually not a tech, not really a technology play, right? Sure. Uh, I think so. Um, I, Maybe I'll talk about AI in a, in a little bit, but um, no, it's very, it's, it, this is not complex. I mean, it's not trivial, but it's not technologically complex. There is a piece uh, around, around vital signs, which is, which is uh, actually driven by a machine learning model in the back. But right. for us, with our partner, um, the way that we look at it is not, oh, we have to wrap our head around the, the machine learning model. It's right. really just, okay, we trust and we've verified that if we send X and we get Y back, then Y is going to be correct 95% of the time or whatever the exact goal value is. Right. And as we go, going back to the, um, the, the co-creation or the collaboration, the more you, um, 
do what I just said about legal and so on, you do that with an external partner, uh, the more trust you create on both sides and the more comfortable you're going to be with just taking, taking something that you get delivered and standing behind it and saying, yep, this is, this is something that I'm willing to show my customers and say, this is your, uh, you know, this is your health score or your blood pressure reading, or this is whatever it is, your credit rating. Yeah. And I think, I think you've, you've highlighted a very important point, which is, um, uh, you know, in all this conversation that uh, we've had so far today versus also the last couple of times, um, you know, technology is literally, it's there, but it's not there, you know, because uh, it's like, is AI being used? Is machine learning being used? The answer is absolutely yes. But have you, you know, hired hundreds of data scientists? The answer is no. You have a specialist team which looks at, Hey, I need that functionality. You guys manage that functionality, and that's the sort of start and end of technology there, right? The whole thing about this is a solving a business problem with creative ideas, with co-creation and and innovation. I, I think that's that's a, that's an extremely uh, important point on on people getting ready for the digital journey. Um, also, when you have something like this, uh, an initiative like this, which I'm, I'm assuming spans over a period of time, um, what sort of business case? Because literally, uh, as you said, there is a discovery process. You know, you don't know what sort of business case is it's going to have. How, how did you? You know, what? How should people go about uh, managing that part of the uh, uh, business requirement, if I may say? Hmm. That's that's another reason I like to frame as much as I can as discovery, right. um, because it allows me to to delay calculating some ROI as much as possible. <laughs> so, um, and I, I'm 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 a big fan. I take a lot of joy and pride in building uh, fancy models. Uh, I, yep. qu I quite enjoy that, um, but if all of the numbers in there are guesses, if all of your assumptions are unverified, what's the point? I can, you know, spreadsheet. I can make a spreadsheet make uh, say anything, right? I can, yeah. I can give you 180 percent ROI, or, you know, it it doesn't. It literally doesn't matter. So I try to push back uh, that piece as much as possible. So, um, again, it helped. I I talked earlier about framing things as experiments and mm -hmm. and what is the quantifiable part of this? Just being clear on, I'm trying to answer the question of. Will people buy this? And I'm going to run a small experiment with, you know, Facebook ads uh, on a product that doesn't exist. I'm just going to have a landing page, and I'm looking at what are the click-through rates, or how many people are going to click buy, and then I tell them this is not available in your uh, in your area code, in your zip code, or whatever. Um, just being clear on those metrics and saying. Um, I'm saying this is good enough and this is not good enough. And always making very clear to people that we're only asking you to fund, uh, quote unquote, this next step, right? We're asking for this amount of money. And after that, we're going to reassess whether we want to spend some more. And we'll be very clear on how much more and what, what it will be for. But you can pull the plug on this uh, at any time. We're not asking for a $5 million investment over, over three years. Um, we're asking you for this step. And then we'll be very transparent and we'll be the first one to, to, to be intellectually honest and kill it if it doesn't have legs. I think that is something um, that takes a little bit of time to gain that trust that you're not going to try to keep your project alive. Um, but there are ways to put incentives around that so that everybody knows that, uh, you know, you're, you're being uh, forthright uh, with, uh, with the information and you're not... Um, you know, you know, bring in your own biases when you're looking at the results. So the more you can quantify, this is a thumbs up and this is a thumbs down, and this is the money that we're putting at risk with this with this step. Um, the more runway people give you before they start asking for a real business case and an ROI. And and, and again, I, I would want to put that off as much as possible until you really feel confident in the in the assumptions that you're making in that model. Because otherwise, what's the what's the point? Yeah, and, and and I think what you the the point that you articulated is also a, a tectonic shift in thinking that's required um, in the industry because uh, there are a couple of other examples that I've seen where the you know the whole concept of experimentation and you know, discovery process, as you rightly pointed out, till you do the experiments, you don't have enough data or you don't have enough points to be able to argue. And and the other thing is. Um, in conventional water model, you know, uh, project management in the past, 
it, you had you had to have a business case before you could even start it, before you even could uh, even, right. even open the doors, right? But now with 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 agile approach, you know, where you do it sprints, you try and do some discovery on the basis of that. Um, you, you create now did you guys also end up using agile methodology or something similar like a sprint or you know four to six weeks or two months of experiment and then kind of um, uh, keep going at it um, and not so much because the the individual steps that we took they were quite disjointed right we we built this little app that we uh, that we didn't brand um, then we ran another experiment that was in the health field around genomics, but had nothing to do with that app. So everything was kind of uh, short term up to a certain point. Um, and, and then even the development time for the first version, um, the first real version, branded version, wasn't terribly long. So we basically just went with a mini waterfall. But uh, to that point, we were recently asked by our CEO, um, is this is are you uh, employing agile development for this next release which is the the, the big one where we're really going public with this to consumers sure. and we had to be honest and say look we're in, we're not really so why why we've trained so many people in the organization on agile and you guys you're not you're not using it you're not you're not employing that um is the vendor not able to do it or what's what's happening here uh so we went and we tightened things a little bit and we uh you know we we went with something that resembles agile, but I think wouldn't get uh, any sort of certification at this point in time. Sure. So it's really this, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of, it's not about agile, but I'm not a big fan of, of rigidly following, uh, following frameworks. I think you just sure. beg, borrow and steal whichever pieces work for you. Um, uh, that being said, I was very lucky early in my career to not, um, to not have to go with a centralized pool of developers and waterfall plans and so on. But actually, and I didn't know this at the time, right? I actually had a team of free developers that were only working for me, only working on this, on, on my project, my product that I was building. And we had weekly release cycles. I, I didn't know this was agile. It was just a way of working and it made total sense at the time. All right? So I think you just kind of fall into the things that, that naturally work. But yeah, um, it all goes hand in hand, right? This, this approach of, uh, going with customer insights and you call it design thinking or something else, uh, de-risking things quickly. And you can call that lean, uh, the lean startup approach if you want, you can put that label on it. Uh, and then that kind of rolls into agile software development. And kind of, you can almost, almost distinctly, not quite distinctly put it into those three phases, right? You want to, you're using design thinking to come up with, uh, with a first idea of what your solution might be. And design thinking kind of permeates the whole process or it sure. should, uh, and then you try to use the, the lean startup approach uh, or experimentation to de-risk or debunk your your theories and your your solution very quickly, and then you might jump back. And I think agile comes into into play once you've actually rolled out your or shipped your first right. version. Right. Um, but I think you know uh, I've thought about this a bit. But uh, I think it really confuses people. All these things are flying, flying around, and what is this? And we're now getting trained in agile, uh, but there's also design thinking and all of this. Um, it's it's unfortunate that so many things go by by different labels, and there aren't many people that go and make clear this is how it all comes together and it all has their place. It's not just a bunch of buzzwords. That, um, Correct. And and in fact, you know, that's that's a, that's an interesting angle that you. Uh, talked about, uh, you know, so I, I, you know, I have been uh, um, involved in the whole sort of uh, lean management and the lean six sigma uh, from my GE days, and and some of the challenges which you used to find with uh, the methodologies was literally um, it, it's the substance versus the format, right? People would get just stuck with this is the way approach, this is the way you need mm -hmm. to follow, and everything else uh, was secondary, whereas uh, whereas most of the times. Uh, some of the successful projects have been you need to achieve certain milestones you need to achieve and and you're trying to fit in what is the best way to to approach it and, and a lot of it is has been actually embodied in in agile thinking uh, unfortunately the world still is looking at agile as the methodology it's the format it needs to be followed to the t uh, whereas uh, you know the, the essence of agile is a lot of it is around quick discovery through lead startup methods, quick discovery, MVPs, et cetera. But most of the people, and, and, and as you said, you know, you, you guys have tons of agile trained people, but they may not necessarily know how to go about it, you know, using those. Uh, and it's, it's, it's quite universal. So 
um, and and I get pumped up always around these topics. But uh, anyways, so coming back to, uh, uh, to um, the questions, um, there, I'm sure there is a lot of data. You know, as you pointed out, there's a lot of data that gets generated, right? Um, did you have to create your own specialist teams to handle data, or is that going to be managed by uh, the partner organization? On um, you know, because I'm sure when they're interacting with your customers. They also will be able to get a good understanding about their behaviors or the patterns, or whatever. Um, it's it's a mix, right? We um, we're looking they're connecting points, right? We we're looking at uh, users of a particular service or a particular app. Um, we're looking at. Uh, at our customers, and there's a there's an overlap between the two as well. So some of the some of the data resides with us, other data resides with our partners, and and a lot of that is either driven by which lens we want to look at a user through, um, and or uh, by by regulation. Right? As a financial service company, uh, we have we have very tight rules as to what can go out of the company. And Korea is notorious for uh, for for its uh, regulatory framework as well. Um, I think it's it's also driven by what you're what you're looking to do, and again, maybe by the phase that you're in. Uh, but you have to figure out what it is that you're trying to answer, or what your measure of success is, and that then really decides on or or, or uh, this drives what it is that you're capturing, where you're capturing it, and how you're analyzing it. Right? You could uh, you could overlay. Um, the data that we're collecting with predictive analytics and then say out of these users, which one is most likely to buy and mm -hmm. um, you can do that and that can be uh, part of step one or it can be part of step three. It really depends on where are your priorities. Uh, do you want to go with monetizing this thing that you built? Um, in our case, through selling more insurance policies, of course, we want to do that. Uh, is it priority number one? Uh, it might not be at this point in time. You know, uh, maybe you decide that before you worry about making money, uh, you want to build the best product that you can. You want to drive engagement. Then you're measuring very, very different things. You're capturing very different things uh, more granularly. Um, as an example, you just uh, if you want to go with an engagement, you just want to take every, you want to make sure you get data on every single click that happens in your app. Yeah. You want that either, either when you built the app, you make sure that's baked into it. Uh, or if you have it built for a partner, you make sure that you get your hands on that information. You get every single session uh, and go as granular as possible. If that's not your priority, but you want to, you want to monetize and you just make sure you have all the demographics and that link between who's a user and who's a customer who bought something later on is very strong and you capture a hundred percent of those. So they're very different lenses and you might be lucky and be able to do both at the same time. Uh, if you're trying to do things fast and uh, with, with uh, limited budget, then I think you're going to have to make a choice uh, one over the other. And that's not, um, that's not a bad situation to be in because it also drives that focus that, uh, that I mentioned earlier. If you, if you just try to do one step at a time, you make sure that you're building the right thing for the, for the right people, then a good thing will come somewhere down the line. Right, excellent. Um, now, looking back, um, uh, you know, you've been involved in this journey for, for a period of time. Um, any other challenges that you would uh, like to highlight to people that they should be aware of when they get started on this sort of co-creation journey? Yeah, a number. I mean, if you want to boil it down, it's really just start small, um, I guess build early and and maintain focus. I think those are the, the three most important things in, in general when, when embarking on innovation journeys. Uh, there are a few other things I think when you're, um, when you're partnering early on, you're really truly co-creating, then one thing, one thing that I learned fairly recently is just letting go of the notion of exclusivity. And mm -hmm. I, um, I think a lot of large companies get hung up on that because uh, there's still this, this sense of, well, this is my idea and I found a good partner now, I wanna lock them up, I wanna get married. And um, that's not always in, in your best interest, and it, very often it's not in your partner's best interest. Uh, so, and, and a funny thing happens when you take exclusivity out of the equation and mm -hmm. you trust your partner to not just turn around and sell all your information to the next competitor. Um, uh, obviously, they, they're free to partner with your competitor, but um, if you trust them enough to not 
you know, do something that's obviously unethical, then they become a lot more relaxed and all of a sudden things happen a lot quicker. Because what, if you ask for exclusivity, first of all, it's going to cost you more sure. on any given measure. Either it costs you more money mm-hmm. outright because that's yeah. an opportunity cost to them uh, or it'll cost you more time because all of a sudden, um, you know, their, their lawyer wants to make sure everything's airtight and you talk, start talking about how long is this going to be exclusive. We spend so much time on things that may or may not be relevant because this thing might not work, right? You, you might find out after six months that you went down the wrong path. And, right. um, you know, and hopefully you haven't spent a lot of money if you followed, you know, somewhat agile approach with this. But then what, you're locked up for three years on exclusivity with this partner and nobody wins with that. Nobody right. does. Um, so once you take that off the equation, good things tend to happen. And, and again, it's a really good piece of advice that I got only in, in the last few years or so. Um, and, uh, and just always keeping an eye on who, you know, what, what is, what is the win for your partners or your partner, depending on how many, you know, what you're building, are you building an ecosystem or is it really just a one-on-one relationship? Cause, uh, as realities change for your company, they also change for your partner company, right? What mm-hmm. you all agreed on as the big goal or, or the dynamics around that three or six months ago might be completely different now. Case in point with Corona, right? The, the realities on the ground change so quickly, but it doesn't take some 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 world altering event for, for things to change and your partner suddenly having different needs. So just keeping that line of communications open, not just on we're working on this project together and we're building this thing, but how's your company doing overall? So one of the first questions I like to ask, um, in particular startups when I meet them is what's your, uh, what's your goal by the end of the year? Or what's your biggest challenge right now that you need help solving? Right. And you will notice over time that that answer changes. And, and especially with, with younger startups, it, 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 the focus shifts quite quickly. So that also changes the value that you can add. You might find that suddenly, um, you, know, you might start out saying, well, we have a million customers. So that's our biggest value add here. You have access to those. Uh, and then you might find out six months later that these guys are trying to raise funds, but the big stumbling block is scaling overseas. They say, well, we have a partner business over in Japan that has 10 million customers. And all of a sudden, that's the biggest angle that you have, and that's the biggest lever that you can pull for them. So um, I think uh, it's a really long-winded way of saying just keep talking to your partner and keep understanding what their realities and their business drivers are. Don't keep it limited to that particular thing that you're co-creating or that you're collaborating on. Right, and I think I think uh, uh, the the project, the initiative. Uh, that you've talked about in the crew creation, there's there's a quite a bit of similarity with corporate ventures. Uh, uh, you know, the corporate venture capitalists, uh, the corporate venture CVCs uh, uh, that we talk about. But I guess uh, that part of the discussion will will leave it for uh, another day. Um, you know, you, you are an expert in this field, and I guess that puts you uh, in a good position to see what are some of the future trends that you likely to see in the space of co-creation you know any thoughts on that um i think maybe and again going back to covid i think the uh location is probably going to going to play less of a role right. um i think you will see more cross-border collaboration which in in some countries will continue to be be difficult but i think maybe this all will make scaling uh, easier for for startups that are in countries that are you know that def- maybe outgrown and I've seen this in the past in in, in Australia um, the collaboration between large and small companies is always again different different levers but there's so many cool startups in Australia that have that struggle to scale to other countries simply because they're geographically far away from everybody else and there isn't that that stepping stone uh, right. that that next obvious market whether it's you know from Korea to Japan or uh, you know, from, from one European market to another for Australia, what is it? Is it another English speaking country? Well, the next one, there's a massive ocean uh, in between. And then, uh, then the next one after that, there's, you know, a massive country and another ocean in between. Sure. Um, and even, you know, a lot of countries are very localized uh, in terms of their, their, uh, their startup ecosystems and so on. Uh, and I think that, that will happen a lot more. I think reach will be much bigger now um, right. in, in the years to come. Right. Excellent, excellent. One last question. Um, if you were to sum up this value proposition of co-creation for the viewers, what would that be? 
That's a good question. I think build better, build faster, build cheaper. Right. I think that's that's an excellent way of putting it. Build better, build faster, build cheaper. That's the tagline for co-creation. Um, so kind of that kind of brings us to the end of questions. Uh, before we go, um, many of our viewers probably want to have a dialogue or have a conversation with you. What's the best way that they can reach you? Email, LinkedIn, um, what would you prefer? I'm really easy to find on LinkedIn. I think if you just type in my name, there aren't that many people that uh, that pop up. Uh, and I'm, I'm always happy to uh, to uh, engage with people there. Just make sure you send me an actual message. I, I, uh, I'm not a big fan of just getting random requests with no context. <laughs> but right. always happy okay. to chat. Excellent, excellent. So I guess, yeah, uh, we'll put your details uh, in the in the video itself. Uh, and uh, but make sure that you uh, send a message of when you put in a LinkedIn request. So, so that would be, um, uh, yeah, that will be the best way to connect with you. So with this, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, sharing your experience, but also uh, sharing your knowledge for others to follow. I think co-creation is a very, very exciting space. So thank you, Nico. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast. So this was the way how you can actually expand your business using co-creation. If you want to hear more uh, similar topics uh, such as this and would like to interact with industry experts, then do let us know what sort of topic would you like to listen to and uh, what sort of uh, ideas would we want to hear. Um, and we'll probably be putting this video on, on YouTube or create some sort of a podcast in the near future. Uh, so I would also ask you to subscribe to our channel uh, and uh, hope to bring more of these, uh, you know, in, innovative new ideas from the business world to all you guys. With this, I would like to uh, wish you all the best. Uh, have a good day and also stay safe wherever you are in this world. Thank you.